this, and, and we're like, okay, let's look at what's going on here. Paul's breaking bread. He's teaching. Something he has to say, you know, if you look at verse 7 or uh, 8, um, he intended to keep on talking until midnight. What was it that he had to say that was so important that he was willing to talk to midnight and all these folks were willing to hang out with their families and listen? What message was were they bringing? So as we go through this, hopefully we will maybe ascertain what the message might have been. Um, if we look at question one, um, what critical conversations have you initiated in your life that were meant to take it, make a difference? What would you say if it was your last time to speak to someone? What nuggets of wisdom would you try to impart and impress upon them? Would you say the things you always meant to say? Um, things that maybe, you know, were uncomfortable. Maybe you were afraid of offending them. Would you say things like, I love you, I'm proud of you, if it was someone you really loved? If it's something you always bit your tongue and never said, do you go ahead and say it? Do you go ahead and clear the air, so to speak? Do you risk alienating them and having them not hear what you want them to hear? Would you have that tough conversation about subjects that were verboten or maybe, you know, shouldn't be talked about? Would your love for the person or persons you were talking to override your fear of rejection? Would you be willing to be thought foolish, crazy, or risk imprisonment in some cases to deliver your message? Have you been willing to share the gospel with others that you come into contact with? Um, every September, most times, I go to West Virginia. I like to whitewater raft, and that's the time to go. And one year I went, and we were sitting in a hotel, hot tub, and this dude comes in, and he's really overweight, really hairy, and I'm like, I'm not really sure I want to stay in the hot tub with this guy. <laughs> but he sits down. He's like, hey, how are you guys doing? Good. He goes, do you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that he loves you? <sighs> you know? He was willing to share his faith to complete strangers in a hot tub at a hotel. Are we willing to do that? I, some, I, you know, I can honestly say no, not, not usually. But here is Paul. He knows he's going to be leaving these folks, and he's willing to talk all night to share the message that he has. As we go to, to question two on your study sheet, it says, based on the context clues, what might Paul have been preaching on that night? What was he talking about that since he was leaving the next day, he was prepared to talk way into the night? And again, why was the crowd willing to listen to this? Could it have been Paul's eloquent speaking style? You know, some people you go to hear just to hear them talk. Could it have been the message he was bringing? What so he weighed so heavily on him that he just had to share it before leaving the next day? So let's, let's look a little bit closer. Um, it's significant that they're meeting on Sunday. They've just taken the Lord's Supper. In verse 7, you know, the first day of the week. Um, it's a change from Jewish culture. The Sabbath in Jewish culture is from sundown Friday night until sundown Saturday. But they're meeting on the first day of the week, which is a change, a move to um, a more... Gentile-like meaning. What other changes or shifts were happening here? Saul, who Paul, who was Saul, who used to be a Jewish scholar and thought the Gentiles were beneath him and you didn't talk to them, here he is in an upstairs room talking to them imparting a message to them that is so important that he feels he has to share it before he leaves them. 
you know, here he is, a man who persecuted them. He, he's breaking bread with them. He's worshiping with them. He's sharing Christ's salvation with them. And I think this is what Paul is doing, is bringing the message of Christ to this group of people, and he wants to share this, even if it takes all night. And we move on to verse 9. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was seeking to a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. And when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Poor Eutychus. You know, his parents drug him along to hear this Paul guy talk. It's hot in the room. There's all these lamps burning. It's smoky. You know, he figures, I'll go sit in the windowsill, get some fresh air, maybe get the cool night air blowing on my back. And this guy's, Paul's just droning on and on, and he nods off. And next thing you know, he falls backwards out the window and dies. But luckily for him, the guy that was droning on and on so was there, and he brought him back to life. Paul comes down, throws himself on Eutychus, hugs him, brings him back to life, and what happens? They go right back upstairs, and they break bread, and they continue preaching and talking. You would think that that would have been, you know, the crowning thing, the, the aha moment, the big, the big, big deal, the climax, so to speak, of the evening, but it's not. Eutychus being resurrected wasn't the showstopper. Paul immediately went back to what he was doing as if what happened wasn't that big a deal. I mean, it was. A young man was raised from the dead, but Paul's message was so important that he didn't just stop right there. He continued preaching. It's kind of like the Wheel of Fortune. You know, you've got Vanna in her delightful evening gown, and she's flipping letters, and they spin the wheel, and there's all these sound effects, and oohs, and ahs, and but what are the real reason people are there on the Wheel of Fortune? They're there to win stuff. They're there to win money. It's all, you know, show, and I think that that's kind of maybe what happened when this Eutychus fell out the window. It's like, okay, this is part of the message. This kid was raised from the dead. And Christ offers that to us. We are, you know, able to find eternal life in Christ. And I think Paul was trying to share that. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily, boom, I raised this boy from the dead, ta-da. No, Paul's like, let's get back upstairs and get back at it. I have something to share with you that's more important than what just happened. Raising, some, raising someone from the dead is great, and it's flashy, and it wows the crowd, and you would think that that's how Paul would have you know, ended his time with them, but it wasn't. He wants to share about eternal life. The physical rebirth is very telling, and it ties in with the spiritual rebirth that Paul was talking about really well. And this is what Paul is offering these folks listening to him. Um, if you want to, you can read Romans 6, chapter, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 at a different time. But it talks about... Um, life and resurrection and being dead to the old ways and, and reborn in Christ. And this is what Paul is trying to share with these people. Um, you know, after we hit verse 11, he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, daylight he left, and the people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Let's you notice how the text in this story begins with breaking bread at the, in verse um, 7, and then they do it again in verse 11. It begins and ends with breaking bread, which I think has significance in remembering. It's, it, you know, we had just taken communion here, the Lord's Supper. It's about, you know, remembering this. And so um, it also talks of community, of breaking bread together, a relationship with each other, not only here in church, but of the world. And I've got a, a table here that I brought, kind of as an illustration. This is a big table, isn't it? It's a TV table. You know, you, you sit, get your TV dinner on it, but as far as community goes, it doesn't work very well. It maybe serves me and 
maybe someone else. It doesn't hold very much. This table is a lot larger. It holds more. But then, like, you think of, like, some of these medieval times. They've got these huge banquet tables. And there's huge, you know, it was quite, you know, the, the social event to gather. And here we are. We've got all these people in this upstairs room listening to Paul. It's community. You know, this, this is small, and it serves me pretty good, but it only serves me. And that's not what Paul's wanting. He's wanting to build community. So, you know, we hit question five on the study sheet. You know, what is the size of your table? And what can you do to make your table larger for, com for better community? Christ calls us to interrelationship with each other and the world. We can't just keep to ourselves. We have to allow Christ to change us like the early Christians were changed. How Christ changed the world. And how exciting this message is. No wonder if Paul felt like he had to share it. You know, God invites us into his death, burial, and resurrection. And these all have daily impacts. Grace, no matter how far you fall, whether it be three stories or maybe stumble and fall just a little bit, God is there to pick you up. And there's new life to be lifted up through Christ. And the third thing is community. You can't live life alone, especially, you know, telling now in these times with COVID, you know, everybody's being asked to isolate. And, but, you know, thankfully, we we're able to gather and take some measures and, and feel community again. Um, if Eutychus was alone, who would have been there to raise him up from the dead? I guess if he was alone, he probably would have been listening to the boring speaker and falling out a window. But my point is, you know, being alone, it's hard to, you know, be isolated. Paul's message is about rebirth in Christ, grace. No matter how far we fall, he's there to help us pick us up, and community. Um, we need to be part of a larger group of community. And I think that that's, you know, what Paul was talking about. You know, there's the analogy of the rope. Three strands are stronger than one. You know, and knowing that you don't have to face life's struggles alone is awesome and I think very empowering. Knowing that you can call on a friend in Christ to listen, to lend a hand. You know, I know if I myself, anytime somebody, you know, asks for me to listen or maybe help I'm always glad to do it, you know, and doing stuff like that builds community and, and it helps further the kingdom. So if you've never been lifted up in the community with Christ and you've never experienced the power of his grace, I want to invite you to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior as we sing our invitation hymn. Feel free to come forward. Somebody will be up here to, to talk with you about that and work with you as you move forward in your next step of faith. Thanks. Would you all stand? good you are good when there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light in the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope 
You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. When my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true. Even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy. You're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I made all. You are God, you are God, of all else. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. My heart will see. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares. Your embrace, light of the world, forever reign. Father God, I thank you for I thank you for the Bible, this interesting book, this collection of 66 books that is chock full of you, chock full of who you are. And God, we know that there are some things in there that are like, huh? But God, we we are thankful for them because because through your Bible we get to see that not everything is perfect. but we know that you are and we submit ourselves to that. So God, as we leave here today, as we leave this place, as we go into our lives, that we would 
put our trust in you, put our trust in your promises, put our trust in who you are, that it would shape our relationships, that it would shape our, our story, our messages. So God, we thank you for all that you do. And we seek your face and we seek for you to be the center of our lives. It is in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. A few things for announcements. Um, we've been doing a few things online. Uh, so Fridays is the Walnut Grove Cultural Conversations where Stephen and I sit down and talk about things that are going on in the world. Um, we also have the Zoom Bible study, which is Monday at, at 7 o'clock. Um, and if you want to be a part of that, then reach out to the office. It's probably the simplest. We sent out a Zoom link, and so um, we encourage you guys to be a part of that. We sit there and talk about the sermon and talk about this story that Greg shared with us. Once, Let's give Greg a round of applause for being willing. And then Wednesday, Stephen goes live at noon. And so those are all the things that are going on online. There are little touch points throughout the week for you um, so that you guys can stay connected and continue to build on the community that we have here on Sunday mornings. Um, so with that being said, I want to give you a blessing. Go and be blessed so that you may be a blessing to others so that they may be blessed and carry it on down the line. Much love and peace and hope and kindness. We will see you guys next week. Bye.